Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm going to be talking about how to pass your Praxis exams by thinking like a test maker and working backward. Let's get started. So over the last nine years, I've been helping teachers pass their certification exams, and I have been studying these exams like crazy to figure out the structure and the language and all of that that's used on the exams. And over the years, I have found different strategies that help when it comes to saving time and zeroing in on the correct answer choices especially when you have those really long scenario questions where there's like a big question stem with lots of things going on and then answer choices that are really long as well. Those can be very daunting, especially for someone who is new to teaching and can't really decipher those different answer choices. In fact, a lot of times people will say all of the answer choices looked like the right answer. And the test is designed that way. That means the test is designed well because it's requiring you to think critically about the answer choices. So I'm going to show you today what you can do when you are faced with those big scenario based questions and narrow it down to one or two answer choices without even really having to read the question. Now, this doesn't work with every single question on the test. I'm going to show you the difference in my presentation in a second. But for the long scenario based questions, I find that this strategy works really, really well. So let's hop over to my presentation so I can show you what I mean. Okay, so this is a question from our Praxis Teaching Reading 5206 book. And this is gonna be focused on the reading process and what we do as reading teachers. But even if this is not your test, this is still a good example of how to work backwards on any exam, special education, PE, you know, English language arts, whatever it is. So I am always going to think like a test maker when I see problems like this. All right, I'm gonna start with the answer choices first. So A. Administer a series of diagnostic assessments focused on specific skills such as phonemic awareness, phonics, and word recognition. Well, I really like diagnostic assessments. This is considered a good word or a good phrase on the exam. Whenever we're using assessments, we're doing data-driven decisions, and that's really important as a reading teacher. So I'm going to leave A. I like it. B, provide opportunities for the students to engage in choral reading so they become more comfortable with reading aloud and building fluency. All right, I like B also, but A right now is my star because it's got that diagnostic assessment word in it. But B is okay. I'm going to leave it. C, group the at-risk students together and provide them with low-level text so they can practice their reading. All right, C is actually a bad answer, and you might say, well, why? We would group at-risk students together and maybe lower the text level. On this exam, we never want to lower the standard. Now, in the real world, would we lower the level? Probably we would. And would we group at-risk students together temporarily? I did a video on this, homogeneous grouping. It is a good practice to use temporarily, and that's where we group students by skill level and do interventions and scaffolds like that, but we don't want to keep them in that group. I don't like C because it alludes to the fact that we might be grouping these students together based on skill, and then we're lowering the standard here. So this is actually a bad answer choice, in my opinion. Now, once I read the question, I might change my mind, but C is looking bad to me. D, request that a specialist pull students out of class. Right away, I'm crossing that off on this exam. We do not want to ask the reading coach or a specialist to pull our kids out of class. We need to make sure we're doing the interventions in class. So C and D have some signal bad words for me that I'm going to cross off. Now I only have to look at A and B, and A is my star. Let's have a look at the question stem. After the universal screening process and an oral reading analysis using grade level text, three second grade students in Ms. Jefferson's class have been identified as at risk. Okay, we got three that are struggling. What should Ms. Jefferson do next in helping these at risk students? Well, we've done a universal screening, which means we've identified the students who are struggling, but that's not enough. If we administer these diagnostic assessments, we can then pinpoint what their deficits actually are and then differentiate accordingly. We can figure out, is it phonemic awareness? Is it phonics? Is it word recognition? So A is definitely my best answer here. B is okay. Choral reading is a good practice for students who struggle, but we don't know if these students are struggling with fluency yet. We've only done universal screening and said, okay, they're at risk. B jumps right into a fluency strategy 
which isn't necessarily what they need. The only way to figure out what they need is to perform this diagnostic assessment. And that's why B is out and A is the correct answer. But notice by working backwards, I was able to narrow it down 50-50 between two. And then when I read the question, I wasn't so overwhelmed with all the information. So this is really helpful on these big scenario type questions. Now, it's a little different when working with a question like this. Notice that our answer choices are just one or two word answers. So I can't really narrow down because close reading, chunking, jigsaw, and think, pair, share could all be the answer. But this part of the question is relatively large. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just read the last little bit here, continuing to work backwards, just to help me understand what's going on. So the teacher has planned for students to read and analyze the text one paragraph at a time, which strategy is the teacher using? Well, this is leading me to chunking because we're chunking the text by paragraph. Now let's go through these other strategies because you may not know what they are. Close reading. Close reading is when we read the text several times for different purposes. So for example, I might read the text one time out loud to students, maybe it's a paragraph, and I'm showing them proper fluency, intonation, prosody on how to read that particular piece. Then we might do a choral read together where we all read the text using proper uh, fluency and prosody. Then I might group them together in pairs or in cooperative groups and have them reread the text, perhaps for vocab or comprehension. Then I may have them go back to their seats and read the text individually and further analyze the text. So notice that we read it three or four times, and that's not really what's happening in the question stem. It could be when I read the, the rest of the question, but it doesn't look like this is close reading. So that's out. Jigsaw. Jigsaw is when you take a large piece of text and you give one group one piece of it, another group another piece of it, another group another piece of it, and another group the final piece of it. Each group reads their piece of text and becomes experts in their paragraph or their page or whatever you gave them, whatever section you gave them. After they become experts and really analyze it and understand it, the groups come back together and they share out their expertise. So essentially, we put the puzzle together by giving each student a piece of the text, and then we all come together and share about the text. That's a way of breaking up a really big piece of text into uh, you know, more manageable pieces, but then getting the whole text together once we, once we put, the piece, put the puzzle back together. That's why it's called jigsaw, because it's like a puzzle. That's not what I think is happening here. And then D, think, pair, share is when I stand in front of the room and I say, okay, students, let's think about why the character would do this in the story. And you say, I'm giving you 30 seconds to think about it. Don't raise your hand. Don't answer the question. I just want you to think about it. So the students think about it. And then you say, okay, pair up with your shoulder partner. And I want you to discuss what you thought about and, and, and share ideas. So they think and they pair up and they, sh and they're sharing each other's sharing ideas with each other. And then the final part is the share part where I might call on one of the students and say, okay, share out what you've learned or what you think. So the think is give them a minute to think pair is pair up with somebody or get into your cooperative groups and discuss it. And share is at the end we share out. And I don't think that's what's happening here. Let's read the rest of the question here. In a high school science class, a teacher is working on a strategy to help students develop both literary and informational reading skills. The teacher has students break down a lengthy and complex chapter on physics by focusing on pieces of the text. The teacher has planned for students to read and analyze the text one paragraph at a time. Now, you might be tempted to choose jigsaw here, but there's a piece missing for it to be jigsaw. Jigsaw means that each group takes a piece of the text and becomes experts on it and then come back and put the puzzle together. In this case, we're just reading pieces of the text one paragraph at a time, and that would be chunking. That's why B is the best answer. Now, notice I couldn't eliminate any answer choices, but by reading this last part first, just the question stem helped me narrow it down even more. So when I did get into the scenario, I was better able to answer the question. 
All right. And this one comes from my SLLA 6990 study guide. This test is for school leaders. So if you're trying to become an assistant principal, you will take a test like the SLLA 6990 or the Praxis 5412. And every question is pretty much a scenario question like this. Long, uh, long scenario here and really long answer choices here. All right. So you're going to want to work backwards on every question on this exam because they almost all look like this and sometimes they're even bigger. So let's have a look at A. Survey teachers to determine their interests. Okay, I like interest and consider that when planning professional development. All right, I like A, surveying teachers is effective. We do want to plan professional development around teacher interest and strengths. A is okay, I'm gonna leave it. B, work with teachers in their PLCs to disaggregate data to identify students' specific needs and plan professional development accordingly. This is very targeted. I like B. The words disaggregate data are good words on this exam and any exam. If you see it on any exam, you're going to want to slow down and pay attention. This is better than A because we're not just thinking about interests. We're actually looking at data to make decisions. C, communicate with the district office and be sure to follow district-wide professional development for reading and math. Now, C in the real world is what we do. Usually the district sends us what professional development we want to, we need to implement. But on this test, we want to think about the perfect scenario. And that's where as leaders, we are looking at data to make data-driven decisions specific to our school's need, specific to our students' needs, specific to our teachers' needs. So C is not great. I'm going to cross it off. And D, plan professional development in reading and math in the content area for all teachers. Well, D is okay, but it's not as good as B. D is just really general and doesn't get specific on what the school needs. So I'm crossing it off. Now you might say all of these answer choices look good. As an educational leader, I would do any one of these things. Here's the key. Let's have a look at the question stem here. What would be the most effective way to determine what professional development to implement? I often get questions from teachers and leaders saying, hey, I took the test and how do I determine what the right answer is? They all looked correct or three out of four looked correct. And this is an example of that, but it's asking you for the most effective and to be most effective as school leaders, we want to disaggregate data. Let's read the whole question here just to make sure. After looking at school grade data for the previous year, okay, school grade data is a lot, it's like a big piece of data, kind of overarching data for the whole school. The leadership team begins the process of researching professional development. So we want to train our teachers according to the school grade data. What would be the most effective way to determine what professional development to implement? Well, surveying teachers is good, but why would we implement, why do we implement professional development? To increase student achievement. That's the whole reason we're here is to increase student achievement and to close the achievement gap. And the only way to do that is to look deeper at the school grade data, disaggregate the data and figure out exactly what our students need. Are they low in reading? Are they low in math? If so, what skills? Is it comprehension? Is it vocabulary? Is it algebra? Is it geometry? Digging down deeper, maybe even digging down based on subgroups. Is it our students from low socioeconomic? Is it our ELL students? Is it, you know determining where these gaps in, in achievement are and filling those holes. That's how we do it. And disaggregating the data is the only way to do that. And that's why B is the best answer. All right. So there you have it. That is how you think like a test maker and work backwards on your exam in those scenario type questions. Now, again, it's not going to work for every single question on every single test, but when you get those big questions with those long answer choices, consider working backwards. Now this may not work for you. You might say, I don't want to do that. I like to read from top to bottom. That's totally fine. This is a strategy that's helped hundreds of teachers pass their exam, thousands of teachers pass their exam, but Everybody's different. And so you may not be comfortable with that strategy. So you can just modify it or scrap it and use a different strategy. I hope that this helps you today. These are difficult exams. And if you're a new teacher, it's hard to decipher between all those answer choices that may look like the right answer. But look for those good words, eliminate those bad words, read the question stem, and then go into the question. And you'll have a better understanding of that item as a whole. This has worked for lots of people, and I hope it'll work for you too. If you're interested in our products for the Praxis Teaching Reading, the SLLA, Praxis Core, PLT, any Praxis exam, head over to KathleenJasper.com and check out our study guides and online courses. We have tons of content there. Thank you so much for watching and have an awesome day.